Thank you everybody for joining me for this webcast with Dr. Hussein. It's going to be jam-packed with loads of information about initiatives that will help you, NHS workers. We're going to dig a little bit deeper into some of the research about isometric training and blood pressure that I know a lot of you have had questions about. We're going to look at further initiatives to support the public and certainly some of your clients for yourselves as well. And we might start to take a little look into some of the sedentary behaviours that we're faced with. So you may recognize this guy, Dr. Hussein, because he is the uh, TV doctor that appears on Channel 4's At Lunch. He's also an ambassador for many things in our industry. Um, he's a champion of many things to do with fitness, and he may also be your GP. Lucky you. So Dr. Hussein, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. <laughs> Pleasure. So I know we've got so much planned. I wanted to find out a little bit more about doing our bit. We've already chatted. We've had one webcast and we've done a blog. So we've dug a little bit into it with the sort of creator and some of the team. But I wanted to know, because you're a recent ambassador to doing our bit. So I wanted to know what made you hop on to doing our bit. Over to you. Yeah. So doing our bit essentially kind of encapsulates everything that I feel we should be doing as NHS staff. Because I remember uh, about two or three years ago, I was running in a like local 10K and one of my patients actually was, was running with me at the time. And just by coincidence, we went past each other and, and he told me, he said, do you know what? It's fantastic seeing you here at the run. It's really inspiring to know that my doctor is also running. But he said that I sometimes, you know, I got demotivated once when I went to a health check uh, with the nurse and the nurse was giving me some advice for physical activity. Yet when I asked them what they did to be active, they were quite honest and said that, no, not much. You know, they, they were quite sedentary and um, they had quite an unhealthy lifestyle. And, and he said that he just felt that that was a little odd getting advice from a healthcare professional. And, and not seeing them do it themselves. And it just made me realize that, you know, as one of the key aspects of what we've got to do as healthcare professionals is lead by example. And that doesn't mean you need to be a marathon runner. It doesn't mean you need to be, you know, some bodybuilder or weightlifter, but it does mean that you need to just get in a little bit of regular activity in whatever form that you enjoy and, and you like, and that fits to you but we do need to lead and access those benefits, especially if you if you are giving out that advice to patients because people need to feel like it's something that you actually connect with. Yeah, it's credible, right? And I, I guess the, the beautiful thing about doing our bit is it's a platform and now a recent app that's there to support NHS workers, which was set up in COVID times. I think it's now in 150 tr 140 trusts, and that's just going and going and going. Um, it's an amazing initiative and with a lot of great backing. So no wonder you jumped on as an ambassador. It's well designed. It's got great information and it's not just about physical activity. It's got information with regards to mental health, well-being, nutrition. Uh, and do you know what? As staff, like one of the things we have to do is look after ourselves. We have heard constantly, you know, the airplane analogy of put the mask on yourself before you put on to others. And I really feel that that's vital because if our well-being is not, it's not somewhere which we're happy with, how are we supposed to care and be compassionate and connect with others properly um, if we are feeling burnt out? And unfortunately, with the pressures that are on the system at the moment, many of us are getting into habits that we're not happy with. And mm -hmm. something like doing our bit can help to just try to nudge and shift people towards focusing on their own health. Because that's not selfish. That's, if anything, I think is fundamental if you want to be the sort of healthcare practitioner uh, reaching your potential. Love that. But I noticed you say also well-being. So it's not just about beasting ourselves. There's a lot of support within the app. But just worth mentioning, you know, NHS workers would action it or enter it onto the platform and then they can access the app and stuff. It's an amazing, yeah. it's an amazing initiative. And I know you've been part of and an ambassador for many of the initiatives. I'd like to come back to those in just a moment, but because we're speaking primarily to fitness professionals, that's you, the Fit Pro community, I'd love to know why you think fitness professionals might have a role in supporting 
these initiatives and maybe um, signposting because I think sometimes with fitness professionals we think oh we can do it all you know we've got everything covered but of course some of our fitness professionals may also be NHS workers so what do you think the fitness professional can do to help NHS workers and maybe the public in a bigger sort of sense? I actually believe that fitness professionals have a really vital role in supporting the health of the nation and in particular the NHS and so much so one of the initiatives that I've uh, co-launched with my colleagues at the Royal College of GPs is called the Active Practice Charter. Now this is a status that that practices can achieve if they are embedding physical activity into their work and there's five key criteria to achieve that And one of the criteria that we put in there, because it was so important, was connecting with your local physical activity provider. And that was because we knew that practices did not have all the skills required in order to advise the patients on how to get active. You know, these guys, yes, have a little bit of knowledge, they're doctors, nurses, etc. But let's not um, degrade what the fitness industry do. They are experts in that field. And I don't expect the GP to be an expert in that as well. You know, I have a lot of interest and I do train and and uh, and I do do those extra qualifications, but that's because that's just my unique interest. That is very much not the norm. And so what we want is for practices across the country to connect with the local providers and get that support. So if I just use my example at my surgery, yes. you know, I've connected with a number of different personal trainers, the local leisure center, clubs, whether it be running clubs, cycling clubs, swimming clubs, um, and they have been invaluable to support us in in launching what was an, and is a NHS fitness club. It's called Leamington Primary Care Network Fitness Club. And we just put on free activities for patients and we are supported by the local fitness industry. And, And if they weren't there, quite simply, it wouldn't have happened. Right, love that. See, a lot of support. But I really love this idea of kind of bridging the gap between NHS and fitness professionals because they are professionals, aren't they? And like you say, your your interest has kind of spurred you on to action that. So do you do you ever feel that there could be resistance sometimes from some GPs with connecting with um, fitness professionals? Or, or do you think that might be something that fitness professionals just think might be there? What are your thoughts on that? No, there is a lot of resistance. And the main things is, one, the fitness professionals find it really hard to communicate with practices. Let's say if they want to approach a practice and work mm-hmm. and support them, like actually communicating is really difficult because, you know, you, when you get through to reception, they're expecting someone to try and book an appointment, not someone to discuss these kind of things. Um, the practices are you know, very busy. And so the practice manager may not be in this position in order to connect Uh, with a local physical activity uh, provider and the other way around practices this is very new to them you know they're not used to you know forming these relationships with a external sector outside the NHS however it doesn't mean it's not impossible and there are some key tips in order to achieve that Um, so for sort of practices, we encourage them to reach out to the patient community because there may well be many fitness professionals within the practice population. So one thing I did is I put out a message on Twitter but on, through our practice account and on Instagram and said, look, you know, anyone here, personal trainer or has experience in boxer size or Nordic walking and all the things that we wanted to try and tap into. And we had people connect with us and we started to forge those relationships. And it's a win-win for both because... For example, uh, Mick, who supports us with the Nordic walking, um, he will do free sessions for our patients in the, let's say, walk that we do. But then they get to know him. They get to connect with him and they do more sessions paid with him outside of those once a week free sessions that we offer. Um, So it's kind of a win win that, you know, yes, they're devoting a bit of time to support NHS patients, but then they're getting more clients and they're really able to showcase what they can do now. If fitness professionals want to try to connect to practices that are already in that mindset, my tip is to simply Google um, RCGP, Active Practice Charter, and then map. And then what you'll see is there's a map across the whole of the UK where you can see all the practices that have put an intention that they are either wanting to be an active practice or they've achieved active practice status. 
because they're going to be receptive. So, so, so connect with them, email them, and see if you can work together uh, in order to forge kind of a relationship that works for both. And, and it's not just my practice where this has happened. There's been many practices now that have shown really good results through kind of working together. Super encouraging. Thank you. That's some great advice because people can now action that. Go ahead. And because I, I remember when I first started in, in my career, I'd sort of go to the practices, I'd go to the physiotherapists and stuff. And some were very receptive and they were like, yes, let me take. At that time, it was, you know, um, leaflets you know, printed off from a photocopier. I mean, it was that sort of thing. But it does take a certain amount of initiative as well to set that up. But this is this two way relationship where both parties can be supporting one another so I think that's really important I think it's worth mentioning here as well for the um the app doing our bit the platform that our fitness professionals also could have a role in that as well because obviously there's provision of fitness and well-being and stuff like that so I know we've looked at that in the previous webcast with Julie and the volunteers um and David Monkhouse talks about it a little bit in his blog um, which I'll obviously link on this for any of the viewers or listeners. Um, but I think that's a really lovely thing to, to look at as well. And it's that thing of giving back, isn't it? You know, and not everything that we do as a fitness professional just has to be in, in our field. It is sometimes, you know, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to that advice Dr. Hussain just said. I'm going to check it out on Google. Oh, my gosh the world can start opening up. And, yeah. and I think, you know, with our, um, I love our FitPro community, um, they are amazing. They're so curious, they are very proactive and they are really invested in their education. And so a lot of our community have specialized in areas or a keen interest in something else. It's, it's phenomenal. And I think, you know, that sort of scope of practice and, you know, not wanting to nudge into a different space. We have this very clear sort of scope of practice. And I think if we can just keep on building those relationships, it would be amazing. Yeah. So um, let's let's get to, we're going to come back to the initiatives and, and the app in a minute, but I know real burning a subject that's been sort of on social media and stuff um, is this new research about isometric training to do with high blood pressure, sort of normalizing it or bringing it down. And these sort of, let's say, static holds. The media have reported things like, it's the plank, it's this. Well, actually, the plank doesn't even feature in that research. It's really interesting. So you've got all these people going, oh, but I thought isometric training was, you know, not great and stuff like that. Now, I know you've done a reel on this, and I've definitely spoken, looked at the research myself, dug deep into it, but that serves me. And I've also looked out to people in my community to give me some clarification, but there is a lot of chatter uh, about this. So I'd really love to know from your point of view, what do you think about the research? What could you advise our community of fitness professionals to do about that? Yeah, no, really good. And and so the key element here is so the study that came out recently is, is what's called a network meta-analysis. So it's it's looking at a number of different studies that have occurred. It's not sort of conducted the study itself, but it's reviewing other studies, collating them together and looking to see trends um, that have come about. And there's always risks with, with research like this because all these various studies have been done with their own parameters and there'll be their own variables and different populations being explored. But it is still useful um, uh, sort of data and useful research, but you just have to sort of be able to um, nitpick it a little bit. And one thing I would say is when they looked at isometric exercises, they were very specific as to the type and amount. But the other forms, whether it was aerobic, strength, hit, et cetera, they were a bit looser on the definition. So that was probably my main sort of limitation that I identified in that piece of research. However, the overarching message is that any form of physical activity helps yes. to lower blood pressure. You know, that's as simple as that. And I do sometimes sort of have patients that come to me and say, oh, I'm worried about exercising because my blood pressure is high. And that's kind of that sort of innate assumption that for some reason, let's say if you're stressing your body out, that your blood pressure is going to be elevated. But that's just not true. It doesn't work like that. So if you think of the blood pressure, that's essentially looking at the circulating volume in your blood. And whenever we're exercising, our muscles are recruiting more blood. 
So your muscles start to get engorged with that blood. And so that will drop the blood pressure because you've moved out volume from the vessels into the muscles. So whether it be a wall squat or a plank or any type of isometric or even aerobic strength, et cetera, you're going to be doing that. Um, and you're going to be achieving that. And the results were that it was statistically significant for any form of exercise. Yes. Now, I can see the logic as to why isometric exercises would be so good. Because, um, again, a lot of people think that, OK, increasing pressure in the system and they confuse abdominal pressure. You know, let's say when you build up pressure, hold, they confuse yes. that with blood pressure. It's not the same. It's not the same at all. And in fact, one thing, one little trick we do in hospital, um, when patients come in with certain conditions, when the heart rate is racing, we actually get them to, to sort of increase their abdominal pressure. Sometimes we give them a syringe to try to blow out or yeah. we get them to just really kind of tense down because that slows the heart rate down. And yes. when you have a lower heart rate, that's also going to lower your blood pressure. Um, so we definitely don't need to be concerned from that sense. And unless people have what's called malignant hypertension, which is a very small cohort of the population, and when they have it, they're generally in hospital, they should be getting active. And we should be encouraging them to get active, uh, regardless of the type and form. I wouldn't say that this data should make you think, OK, so if a patient comes to, well, well if a client comes to me with a raised blood pressure, I need to just focus on isometric exercises. Not at all. But yes, know that there seems to be good evidence in what we do have that it is quite effective. And it, to be fair, it had a much bigger drop than we'd seen in some of the other exercises. But I feel that the sort of evidence that they used looking at the isometric was from more, you know, refined and specific studies, while the aerobic and the strengths, it was very kind of vague and much more wishy-washy. So, um, and when you looked at the results, there were wide ranging results. And yes, they pulled out an average, uh, which was, let's say, a, a drop of four for the systolic, which is the top figure and two and a half for the bottom figure. But when you have such variability, you can't be as confident with that number. It's going to be somewhere within it. So... My overall take home is physical activity helps with blood pressure. And yep. yes, this data, and I would uh, encourage people to look and read through the, the, the paper if they feel they're able to interpret. But yes, this data does seem to rank them into some degree, but we need more specific research comparing these exercises like for like. Do you know what I mean? Because you can't compare, for example, a 10 minute run with 10 minute isometric exercises. It doesn't work like that. So, um, yeah, we do need a bit more like for like uh, comparators. Yeah, love that. Thank you for some clarity there. And I think it's worth just saying to the fitness um, uh, community, you know, we have sort of things, uh, recommendations of when we refer out and I'd stick to that. Um, but yeah, when you, you're given that sort of authority to exercise and stuff, you know, it's worth digging deep into that research. Um, the more and more I've done this, I'm like, oh, yeah. So it, it, sometimes it is this select group and it is I've learned so much, but often through other people and they're going, did you know this is flawed? I'm not saying this is flawed. And I'm like, oh, yeah, it's it's a fascinating subject. So thank you for some clarity on that. So yeah, yeah. I, I it's not like so these studies go out to make it flawed it's just that inherently in in certain ways of doing research you kind of have to have it flawed because otherwise you have no kind of research reviewing these kind of things or you spend a lot of money in order to achieve the quality of study you need which actually to do on this scale for these is really difficult that's why you don't see many of these often those kind of landmark studies are done very rarely by big institutions so i still think there's a place for these kind of sort of yes looser in terms of the accuracy but still they they, they open questions and they'll they'll sort of be enough for let's say let's say if there was a big group let's say loughborough university wants to look at this they could see this meta-analysis again oh there may be something there let's do the big research in order to know this for sure yes absolutely love that thank you so my my question so as we're coming on the back of this is when i have been a educator to level two level three and we're talking about blood pressure um and people are sort of saying oh i've got to refer out to the gp because of blood pressure being at this this rate and stuff and people are sort of saying well you know um my 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 client won't go because they have to pay for a doctor's letter and stuff can you tell us in authority what actually happens so i'm Teresa, 
I've gone to the gym, they've done my initial assessment, they've said, you know, I potentially my blood pressure's been a bit high. I, I don't know, Therese, I do know, obviously, uh, but I don't know. And so I go along to the GP. I've already said to the gym instructor, oh, let me in, I'll be fine. You know, I'll listen to my body. And I've also said, oh, but the doctor's going to charge me for that. And I won't get an appointment for weeks. What is the reality of the situation? when it comes to you being a GP and someone turning up, Teresa turns up as your uh, patient saying, okay, the gym won't let me exercise until you've said so. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about that because it, it is something that drives GPs up the bend as well. So it's both ends. So like I totally can, well, I don't say I think I can totally understand why, but I can see why there's these safeguards in place uh, for, for these kind of, instances and invariably 99.999% of the time when we have these patients the thing I want them to do most is exercise based on the yes. fact that we've identified it like that that's I, I kind of like why they, we need to go to the gym why are you even here for me to tell you you can go um however like I think where some of the difficulty comes in is so practices do have the right to charge for that letter because it's what's it's what it's not core NHS work. So anything that isn't core NHS work isn't in the contract. So uh, this will be done in addition to the GP's time. Uh, so they may well charge somewhere around the sort of twenty seven pounds kind of is sort of the rough figure that most uh, practices would charge for that. And some GPs, in particular, if they have no personal experience and they've done no kind of extra training or interest in physical activity, may not even feel comfortable enough to write that letter because it's not something you learn in university. It's no, there's no specific training to say, yes, you can sign this person off. And that unknown makes them worry and think, that oh, if I write a letter saying that they can exercise and then in three months time they have a stroke, you know, I'm in trouble. And so sometimes you can have these issues where the GP won't write it or um, where patients obviously will, will most likely have to pay for the letter. Like, you know, when they come to see me, of course, you know, I'm more than comfortable having these kind of discussions and, and consultations. And it's I think if there's any healthcare professionals listening, you know, that letter is not to say that nothing bad's going to happen. But it's just to say that that particular condition isn't going to be um, exacerbating any by physical activity. And yes, yeah. the thing is, yeah, you can be active if you have those pre-existing issues and yet something bad can happen. But that's probably going to happen anyway. Um, and and I think when it comes to indemnity, they know that, you know, there are no cases out there where GPs have written letters and trust me, I've checked. And let's say they then have a negative event further down the line where that's become an issue, because the thing is, you can't tease out if someone is got high blood pressure and let's say overweight and, and inactive and all the various risk factors and they have a complication that happens all the time with everyone whether they're active or not physical activity we have got good evidence to show that unless they have specific cardiac issues and it's within and you guys have all the rules that you go by and they've had a recent heart attack and they've had a recent stroke and you, we, we've gone through those time frames it is going to be a benefit it is going to be a benefit. That's why we have exercise labs in cardiology departments in hospitals. So I think the kind of key message here is that, yes, patients are unfortunately going to have to pay for that letter. Uh, in most cases, I don't charge just because I'm quite happy to, to do it and it doesn't take me much time. And I, I want to encourage and send the patient and send the message to the patient that, look, please get back to the gym or, or the, to the club or wherever it is that you're looking to get active. Um, but yes, I can totally understand the frustrations and we try to try to improve, we try to improve things by launching a sort of a consensus statement. So a couple of years ago, there was a consensus statement from all the Royal Colleges and it was published in the BMJ, uh, stating that physical activity helps nearly all physical health conditions. And we just listed the ones where we were like in these conditions, there is caution, um, and, and yeah, and so blood pressure is one of the conditions that we really feel it can help massively. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, like it's 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 one of my main frustrations, one of my main frustrations that it, the patients have to come back to the GP to then go back to the gym. And it's not sending out the right message. It's like another barrier, potentially, isn't it? It might have taken someone yeah. months, months or years to get into the gym. And then they're sort of like, well, you're not good enough to be here. And then they've got the additional. Or potentially it's dangerous. You know, it's sending yes. that kind of, if, if I need a letter in order to, to say that I'm OK to do this, that maybe it's borderline, maybe it's dangerous. And it's the opposite. Not being active 
that is dangerous. That's what you need a letter about. Um, but it seems to be the madness of, of the situation that you need a letter yes. to be healthy. That's interesting. It's really interesting, isn't it? So I'd love to come back to the initiatives you've worked on. So doing our bit. Um, what, what is kind of your role in doing our bit? What um, kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. So, I'm just it. ambassador. So just ambassador, basically just trying to spread the message encourage NHS staff to connect with the platform um, and really kind of get the message out there that, you know, movement can be something you do in your living room and you've popped it on the TV. Let's say you've, 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 you've connected the, to the website or you've casted the app and you can just do the exercise. Exercise can be five minutes long. You know, yeah. it could be something that you just have on your phone while you're brewing the coffee, um, you know, or while you're brushing your teeth. I think, We've got to engineer movement back into our lives because over the last 150 years, ever since, you know, the Victorians and slightly before that, we've worked on engineering it out, you know, Absolutely. from the chair to the to the electric whisk, to the car, to the remote control. We don't even have to go to the TV to press the buttons to the now we've got robot mowers. We don't even have to mow our grass. And it's all that does is it means that physical activity starts to become something you have to time box you know you I have do. to find time in my day to be active when before you know like we're 20 percent less active than in the 60s and that's not because in the 60s they cared more probably we care more now but it's just in the 60s just we had less of the things that remove the activity out yeah and actually as a fitness um community we are you know Say, we're just not doing enough to get sedentary people moving so you know I, I I said at the beginning the introduction we talk a little bit about that sedentary piece and I think what's really lovely about the app um sorry the platform and the app for NHS workers is that it you, you said you could do it in your living room you don't have to be part of because a lot of the time it is about fitting it in or it may be that you don't want to turn up to the gym or it's cost you know, and and I think that that's a really important bit. So as a fitness community, so fitness professionals, you know, I think, and also you're into your fitness yourself. You know, I think that we sometimes just, we don't always get it. We just kind of like, why wouldn't you want to exercise? It's fun, it's great for you, it's, you know, I've met friends and stuff and and yet there is such a huge amount of um inactive people and I wanted to sort of quiz you about that a little bit and obviously then that can sort of segue you into some of the initiatives that you are part of including the app because I think if fitness professionals think that the only way people are going to move and look after their well-being and health and fitness is by always coming to a PT in a gym, I, I, I don't think that's right. So I wanted to hear from your point of view, because clearly as a GP, you see it differently to fitness professionals. You're interested in fitness, but also you are an ambassador for so many things to support people. So over to you on those. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. And it was I was actually in the House of Lords last week trying to encourage sort of a kind of a realization of why we are at this point because the sort of, let's say lack of movement the you know obesity crisis that we're dealing with the diabetes crisis we're dealing with um the, the high blood pressure crisis we're dealing with it's all related to the same issues and it comes actually down to something you may be surprised with and in my opinion it's what's delayed gratification quite simply our brains are wired to get to want and seek reward. OK, that's what it wants. And no matter how you put it, I absolutely love physical activity. I do it all the time. I even do it on a professional level. But no one will tell you that you get instant gratification from physical activity the first time you try. It, OK, it is difficult. It takes time and investment before you start to get more of the rewards, whether it be running and it takes a few weeks before you feel like you're not constantly dying, um, whether it's going and, and doing strength training and, and, and actually, you know, enjoying the sort, of the, the, the sort of the pain that you go through and the cycles of that. These things take time. Mm -hmm. However, now we have more and more things that will give us instant gratification. And one way to put it is think about how many people can go to the toilet without taking their phone? 
Okay. And this is particularly, to, oh yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, it's better for women, but for men, trust me, like a good proportion of men will go to the toilet and they'll take the phone. And the question is why? And that's because they need the gratification and the reward from seeing a funny video or some social media post or something like that. And that's the same reason why, for example, you know, we'll buy that bagel from the shop and they say walk five minutes to there, spend seven pounds, you know, five minutes back, wait 10 minutes for them to make it. But then we won't make the bagel ourselves for like a tenth of the cost, probably less time in total, because when we go to that shop at lunchtime during work, we get that reward like that. When you make the bagel the evening before in the morning, you're getting no reward for at least six hours or maybe even longer if it was the day before. Mm -hmm. And we have to, in order to correct what we're seeing and the trends we're seeing, we have to find ways to deliver reward in the training that we're giving to our clients as early as possible. So that's why uh, yeah. if I then link into some of the initiatives that I do, let's say the walk, talk, walk, and the run, talk, one, and the swim group, from the first session, even before they start moving, we do fun things. We switch on music. We have a little warm up with dance. We sort of get everyone talking. We, we try to, you know, it's all kind of funny and connecting because we're trying to deliver some reward even before they've done the physical activity. Because if we just did the physical activity session, they're not going to enjoy it that much. They're going to find it really hard. The next day they're going to be achy because they haven't done anything for a long time. And then if they're waiting for the reward to be weight loss or the reward to get fitter, then we know that's going to take months and months. We know the stuff on social media about six weeks and that that's all rubbish. It takes months and months of dedication. And the problem is everyone's looking at that as the reward. And therefore they lose motivation after a number of weeks because they haven't achieved that yet. But if we focus it on the community, on the mental health benefits on the kind of connection that you can get and you can the joy of the process and the journey then you can try to engage clients to push at it because yes. I remember what it was like I remember when I tried to get active when I was younger I was very sedentary for most of, sort of my teenage and university years and I remember going to the gym because I wanted to look better I wanted to look fitter and stronger and more muscly um, and after three months I just quit because after three months nothing really had changed you know Facebook told me that that after 12 weeks, I was going to look incredible. And I didn't. I didn't even look close. And so I was just like, what's the point? This is so much effort. I'm going four times a week and nothing's happening. Uh, little did I know that this takes years, 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 years. And if I started to enjoy the process, then it didn't mm. matter about the end result because I'll just be enjoying the journey. So I think that's the key bit. Try to implement reward early on because that's how our brain is wired. Absolutely. And the word that I want to pull out immediately, as you were saying, is community, isn't it? You know, I mean, we can exercise in solitary, of course, but you, you um, have been part of Park Run, yep. right? And then you've got Absolutely. Run, Talk, Run. Yep. Yes. And from my understanding of that, it doesn't have to just be running. Correct. No, no, it's walking. So we do walk. There's always a walk, talk, walk group and a run, talk, run group for whatever you want to do. And, and the reason we put the talk in there is because, like, we don't time it. We don't, like, there's no PBs. We run at the, the pace of the slowest runner or walk at the pace of the slowest walker. And we just have a chat and we connect. And the one thing that, that the clients say to me after we do those sessions is, do you know what? I just, I can't believe I've just walked four kilometers. You know, like, it feels like, I don't even remember. I was just chatting away, having fun. We saw some cool sites and we tried to implement fun ways of getting other components of activity in. So with our walk, I try to target it towards older patients. And in particular with older patients, we want to improve strength. We want to improve coordination and stability. And what we do is we go to the playground and kid you not, and I, I put it on my social media, like we get them to play on the swings and on the, 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 the climbing frame and that kind of stuff. because that is going to test their strength, but they won't realize it. They won't realize what they're doing, but they are testing their coordination, testing their strength. Um, and we're just doing it in a fun way. And they just think, oh, I've just been a kid again. And they just sort of let that out and they're, they're joyful of it. But what they don't know is actually they've done a 10 minute strength workout and a, you know, 40 minute walk aerobic workout. Brilliant. Love it. Love it. So, okay. Park run, run, talk, run. Yeah. The swing side of things. Yes. So, so yes. So so I'm a I'm a clinical advisor for Swim England. And mm. recently, three months ago, we launched a NHS Swim Together group. 
So this was specifically aimed at those with long-term health conditions where they could get access to the pool for free. And we worked alongside Everyone Active, which was the leisure center. Um, and they were extremely supportive and helped uh, with the measure. And we also worked alongside Swim England and Mental Health Swims. Now, Mental Health Swims are an incredible CIC that have a number of locations for open water swims. But yeah. I love open water swimming. But for many of the patients that I was talking to, it's it's a jump too far in the sense that they just they, they, they barely know how to swim and they just don't feel comfortable in the open water. Totally get that. So we approached them and we decided, look, can we do the same thing in the leisure center pool? You know, we know that pools at the moment are really struggling due to the increased energy costs that they're having to pay. And the numbers are dipping. So we thought this could be a win-win. If we could encourage people that would have never thought about swimming before to access a mode of physical activity that's brilliant for them, you know, helps to reduce the pressure on the joints. And it can really be uh, great for people, for example, going through the menopause where they're getting a lot of fatigue and aches. And the other benefit is with swimming, when you're in a pool, there's no way of knowing, you know, who's first, who's last, because no one keeps count of the laps. I can barely keep count of the amount of laps I'm doing. Um, <laughs> and so it can be really great to just people not to stress out because a lot of the time they won't come on the run or they won't come on the walks. They're like, oh, I don't want to keep everyone up. You know, I don't want to, I don't want everyone to slow down for me. Um, and the swim, they don't need to worry about that. So it's been fantastic. We've been doing it for three months and we've recently agreed a plan to continue this longer term because it was initially a pilot and we've had some fantastic feedback from patients and, and it's been a real joy to deliver. Okay. And you've had a go on the platform and the app of uh, doing our bit and stuff. So what what is your feel of it? I know you're an ambassador, but what's your, what's your feel? Because obviously we've got, we'll have some NHS workers on here, but also what I pride about our community fitness professionals is that they will signpost people to great initiatives. And what I want to say, I don't know why I'm pointing. I, I've got a pen here. I don't <laughs> know why I'm pointing because it keeps on going away like it's magic. Um, but, you know, we are really good at signposting people to great initiatives. Yeah. And I think that's really, really important. We don't want to just keep them as if they're our flock and if we if we know as fitness professionals that what you know some of our clients are nhs workers why wouldn't we send them to that and the the the, the quality i can say about it is it's all you know quality check yeah. which I, I when i chatted to the guys initially i was i thought it was a brilliant initiative but when i understood the quality behind it and who's involved i was like oh okay so that's why we're sort of championing it um so what as a user rather than an ambassador, what were your thoughts on it? Yeah, so like when I first used it, I was kind of uh, wondering, you know, was it going to be something that, let's say, if you're already active, the sessions just wouldn't really kind of test you, etc. But what I saw was that, yes, the quality of the sessions are fantastic. And I can totally get why they do the quality assurance on these, because you could tell that in the end product. But it was just so accessible for both kind of people. So whether you're uh, an HS worker that's already active, I promise you these sessions are going to work you out like they very much did for me. But like with all these things, if, if the training is delivered in the right way, it is accessible for anyone. You know, everyone can take out the intensity that they need for their current fitness and their current position. Um, and I just loved how it was delivered. It was easy to follow. It was the, 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 the sort of the timings of the different kinds of workouts are perfect for someone that's just, you know, trying to fit in a bit of time here and there. Because like the number one thing I hear from from staff within the NHS is that, oh, I don't have time to do a full hour or I don't have time to go to it. Well, you don't need to do a full hour, you know, just do 10 minutes to start with and then maybe see if you can do 15 minutes after a few weeks and more. Just even getting a little bit that's better than nothing. And it don't feel that if you can't do what you envisage as a proper workout, that suddenly half an hour or 20 minutes or 10 minutes isn't useful. We know from the data and the research that any form of movement that gets your heart racing, even if it's for short periods, it's better, okay? It's better. And obviously we want to do more where we can and reach the 150 minutes that you know we talk about and the, the physical activity guidelines. But trust me, action is better than inaction in those situations. The website is just a great tool for just simple, focused, fun, 
and kind of exercises that you could even do as a family. You know, if you're going in, you can do these kind of workouts as a family, make it fun. Um, and it was actually they're, they're so good that I invited them to a, a conference that we did in the RCGP. And like just a lot of these webinars, you sort of just sitting down in a chair for the whole time. We, we, we had 15 minutes of doing our bit in the middle and the feedback, like they just stole the show. You know, they just stole the show. They didn't care what I'd said for the sort of hour beforehand. It was just the 15 minutes of activity. And it just shows how much we all want to do physical activity. And I felt that it was just fantastic that in the working day, we managed to get 15 minutes in and they had already noticed the benefits from just 15 yeah. minutes. So that's why yes. we've got to try and do that as much as we can, little and often. I think it's never a waste of time, is it? You know, you can waste time just exercising and having fun, but it's never a waste of time. You exactly. know, it's, no it's one really... regrets it afterwards. I've never met someone go, oh, God, I shouldn't have done that. Shouldn't have done Why the hell did I do that? <laughs> but, but we regret not to do it and go, oh, I missed out. What did I miss out on stuff? So, right. um, You have shedded a lot of, you know, information on initiatives and and being helpful to us actually as fitness professionals, giving us sort of some insight into what you do, what we're faced with, how we can bridge gaps and, and stuff like that. Is there anything that you wanted to talk about or mention that we haven't covered so far in this recording? No, not specifically, but one thing I would really try and do is, you know, reach out to those active practices, you know, go on, look at that map, identify the practices around you because I think that's just a fantastic way to start forging more relationships between healthcare and the fitness mm -hmm. industry because we know that if we're going to keep the NHS alive and I'm being serious here we do need to get people moving simple as that and doctors and nurses are going to do what they can but we don't have the expertise that the fitness industry has so let's work together um and and when we work together you can just be able to get the benefits of both worlds we can very quickly for example if the practice has a relationship with the physical activity providers they can write those letters probably easy free of charge that's what we do in our fitness club you know you know um mick or nina will just say oh is this patient okay to get active i'll look through the notes have a have an exploration i'll be like yeah totally fine because we're working together to a common goal. So really do try and reach out. And yes, sometimes you're going to get no email back. But if you reach out to enough practices, you'll get one where there's someone as inspired like me. And you can start to forge a, you know, a relationship that is mutually beneficial. Love that. And you know what, if it's not the right time for someone listening in right now, they know somebody who it is the right time for. So you can jolly well tell your friends too, because I think that's a brilliant thing to get behind. And anything where you know, you're working collaboratively is always a win-win. And let's be honest, getting more people moving is just a win-win, isn't it? A massive win-win. Okay. Yeah. It's needed. Yeah. It's really needed. Yeah. And it's easy for us as fitness professionals to sort of, you know, think it's easy. But actually, you know, we, we, we can do a little bit more, I think. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. That's given us a lot of inspiration. Um, so I obviously want to thank you for your time. I know you're very, you are doing so much. Do you have more than 24 hours in the day? Because I suspect you do. <laughs> oh, I wish, I wish it would be nice. But yeah, no, God, things are busy at the moment. I'll give you that. But uh, I guess like with many that will probably resonate to uh, listening or watching, you know, when you're doing something that you're passionate about and you want to support other people to achieve that, like I'm more than happy to do any kind of work in this kind of domain in this regard you know it really is like a purpose that I want to try to support others because I haven't always been active I'll be honest with you I've, I've in the in the past I've struggled being active I've struggled with my weight I've struggled with with all sorts and and I want people to gain the benefits that I've gained through physical yeah. activity and interestingly it's got nothing to do with the vanity side of it it's got everything to do with the sanity from it and the sort of the the kind of the well the well being the balance that it gives you and yes. that's what I want to try to translate. Love that. Thank you so much for your time, your wisdom, and I love talking to people who are passionate about things. I think it's so exciting to hear from you. And um, thank you to everybody uh, tuning in and taking, you know, time out of your day. Well, you could have been exercising at the same time. I just don't know. Wouldn't that have been a, a win-win? <laughs> but thank you to FitPro community for joining us and Dr. Hussein. Where would they be able to follow you and what you're up to? Yeah, so on Instagram at Iron Doctor H A Z, which are my initials, and on Twitter 
It's Zubaidi, Z-U-B-A-I-D-I, and then Hussein, H-U-S-S-A-I-N. Perfect. Hussein, I think you've got a busy day. Um, I'm going to leave you with that. And obviously, we have to finish with a cheesy wave. <laughs> Take care. Stay active. Thank you.